Hi, I'm Dan Klimke. I'm the OptiView product manager for Fluke Networks from Everett, Washington. Nice to be here. And I'm Zach Belcher. I'm product manager for TrueView, also part of Fluke Networks, and I'm located in Austin, Texas. I'm uh, Steven Ochegrosso, uh, senior network engineer in retail. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Stephen086, and I'm blogging at ccieornull.net. Um, David Varnum. My Twitter handle is at David Varnum. My blog is mindsafe.wordpress.com, and I'm also in retail. I am Brandon Carroll. I blog at globalconfig.net, and you can find me on Twitter at Brandon Carroll. Kale Blankenship. Uh, I work for a bar in Alaska, and uh, I'm on Twitter at vcabbage. I blog at vcabbage.com. Uh, I'm Rob Coot, a system analyst with a public K-12 school division and Tokyo Canadian. Uh, I blog uh, at networkcanuck.com, and my uh, Twitter handle is uh, at Rob underscore Coot. I'm Jody Lemoyne. I'm a network architect with Tishco Networks, also Canadian. Um, I think my Twitter handle is Ghost in the Net, and I link it to blog on other blog sites that I because I don't have my own on Cisco.com and soon to be a few on packet pushers. I'm Jonathan Davis. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at subnetwork. You can also find me at subnetwork.me. Uh, I'm a senior network engineer for a large enterprise customer. I am Amy Arnold. I'm a network engineer in the public sector. I'm Amy Engineer on Twitter and I blog at amyengineer.com. I'm Bob McCouch, uh, CCIE and independent consultant. You can find me on Twitter at Bob McCouch and I also blog at herdingpackets.net. I'm Pete Welcher. Uh, I've been a CCIE for way too long. I do route switch and data center consulting for Chesapeake Net Craftsman. My Twitter handle is at PJ Welcher and my blog at netcraftsman.net. I'm Robert Novak. I'm a Deep General System Administrator. I blog at rsts11.com and I'm on Twitter at Gallifrey. I'm Tony Mackey, a network engineer in the enterprise ISP and data center markets. You can find my blog at rotojockey.com or on Twitter at uh, T-O-N-H-G. <laughs> 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 I was waiting for a dot com for some reason. <laughs> my, my name is Scott McDermott. I'm a network engineer in the public sector. I blog at mostlynetworks.com, and you can find me on Twitter as at scottm32768. <laughs> my name is Taryn Bryson. Uh, I used to be a real engineer, but now I work for a partner and spend my time telling people how great I used to be. Um, you can find me online at some clown, and I blog at blog.packetq.com. <laughs> Ethan Banks, I'm a senior network architect for Care Connection, which is a, a telemed company, and uh, I'm also the co-host of the Packet Pushers podcast. I blog at ethancbanks.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at ecbanks. All right, great. Welcome. Thank you, everyone, everyone for having us here today. Uh, Zach and I are product managers at Fluke Networks, and we're going to be speaking with you today about application-aware network performance monitoring or management, otherwise known as AANPM by many people. Specifically, we're going to talk about Fluke Networks solution using Visual TrueView and OptiView XG, and we'll go through exactly what all of that means. Uh, first, of course, got to do the little tip of the hat to the corporate message. Uh, Fluke Networks is a part of the Danaher group of companies, uh, 50,000 associates, uh, 19 billion in sales annually. They have five different what they call platforms or groups of companies. And of course, we're in part of the, we're in the test and measurement platform, uh, which consists of Fluke Networks, Arbor, and VSS, which are also here at the show, Tektronics, Tektronics Communications, and uh, Fluke industrial and precision measurement uh, uh, test equipment. And then Fluke Networks is our operating company. Uh, we growing, rate about 7.5% a year, serve market size about 2 billion, and a little over 350 million in sales annually. So that's kind of who we are and where we fit in our parent company and organization. From a product standpoint, uh, one of our core philosophies about product development from this start of when Fluke Networks was developed and, and initiated was the right tool for the right person or the right tool for the job. And so, yes, we've got a lot of different things and different form factors from small handheld tools, tablet tools, and server-based tools. 
for monitoring troubleshooting across the network, and also some tools specifically for point uh, particular uses, like our Air Magnet Enterprise product for uh, wireless network intrusion detection and performance management, and the Network Time Machine, which is a stream to disk appliance. Right now, we're focusing that product on the carrier LTE market, uh, and then Visual TrueView has the ability to do stream to disk for the enterprise market. So just a little bit of an overview of uh, what our focus is in our company. And of course, have to have the obligatory sheet of logos. Uh, this is basically saying that Fluke Networks, we've been around in the industry since 1993, uh, when we first came out with our first handheld network tester. But we've grown to cover a range of verticals, and if you notice some of the names and logos, it's worldwide. Fluke Networks has presence around the world, uh, over 250, 300 people involved actively selling and supporting our products around the world. And fortunately, uh, it, it, we were named a leader in the uh, Gartner NPM D Magic Quadrant recently, and I think that's a great reflection of the commitment that we've made to the industry, uh, some of the advances that we've made in the product line, and we're uh, happy to have that recognition for Fluke Networks. And I'm going to, uh, before I turn it over to Zach, just point out a couple of another thing that we've heard from the analyst community. Jim Frey from EMA, he's talking about this solution bringing together two best-in-class solutions, and that's the OptiView and the TrueView together. We're going to talk about how these products are integrated together and how that integration is not just a hyperlink to a separate UI with a separate login with separate data. Uh, we're going to talk about how these two devices are completely integrated together seamlessly for our customers. The result, as Jim points out, is the ability to see, as he puts it, the full application delivery context, central and remote in a single console, with this unprecedented levels of detail for assessing and troubleshooting network and application performance. So we're pleased to be getting this recognition in the industry for the work that we've done over, the, over time. And uh, before we get into the product details, I'm actually going to have Zach walk through this uh, AANPM market, a bit about what that means and where we fit in that market. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, so as Dan mentioned, I wanted to start out by just setting the, the stage. I know we have a mixed audience, so let's just start out by defining what is AANPM. We, we love our acronyms, right? Um, the idea behind this is just that the network performance management market has matured over the past decade, decades, if you will, from just monitoring networking endpoints to actually being able to, actually needing to start to understand the actual applications and their performance. And that's for a network engineer to actually understand that, right? Our APM guys have always, or sorry, our, our app owners, if we will, have always focused on APM data. But what kind of data do we need as a network person to be able to troubleshoot, to manage performance, even though it's application data? And so what I've built here is a little timeline that just kind of talks about what we've come from and where we're going to in terms of monitoring. In the beginning, all we had were, I'll call legacy NPM, right? We've always been able to do things like pinging, checking uptime, getting availability. We've had device polling for decades. And of course, we've always been able to pack it, or capture packets for the most part. That next level was when we started to become aware of what, how this stuff was being used, right? It's no longer just a utilization line on a graph. It starts to turn into data that we get from NetFlow or NBAR and actually understand, hey, I see it's 80% utilized, and now I know what that traffic is. That, of course, helps us do things like quality of service so we can actively manage that traffic and, and actually start to control who's doing what and, and what kind of service those, those users will get. And then we start looking at things like response times, and that starts out with things like synthetic tests and IPSLA to start saying, well, you know, it's not just enough to monitor these endpoints and what their, their interface utilization is and what traffic goes across it, but also monitor, well, how fast can I get from point A to point B? And I want to start tracking that. And then the next logical step has been, and we've seen this in the, in the mid to late 2000s, things like TCP calculators, and finally looking at actual application transactions but looking at them from the network layer. So as a network engineer, I need to know how fast this app is being delivered across the network. So that's just kind of that logical progression that we've gone through. And the reason we've hit that is because, you know, it's 2014, 
despite what Back to the Future showed, we don't have flying cars, there are no hoverboards, right? And we still have this problem. The network is slow. We're still getting this call, right? The future hasn't arrived yet. And where do we begin to troubleshoot this? Because I bet you guys have data on all of these things. I bet you can log into these things. I bet you can pull up some tool that gives you system information on all these different endpoints. But when someone says it's slow, where do you start and how do you know you're starting in the right place? And if you find something abnormal about, you know, hey, there's a lot of sessions on the firewall. Is that related? Is that part of my problem? I don't even know. I found something anomalous and now I have to chase that down. So we're still at this point. And to answer that question of where do you begin, well, let's first convert what we've always talked about as the OSI model into reality because where you're going to begin is probably dependent upon what's your area of responsibility. Which of these things do I own? Because that's where I'm going to begin. So if you're on the networking side, network engineers, network operations, you're going to be checking things like availability, interface utilization, link errors, connectivity issues. And so you're going to check all these things. You're going to go, it looks okay. Utilization's low. I don't see any errors. Everything looks fine. It's not the network. It's not my problem. The app guy or the server guy, he's going to look at the, the CPU and memory on that server. Maybe he's looking at system logs or application error logs. I don't see anything. Looks good on my end. Must be a network problem. The problem is we're just looking at these endpoints. Neither side here is taking a look at the actual delivery of what the user was trying to do. How long did it take the user to complete what they were doing, okay? So many of these problems really require that joint ownership and expertise to say, how did it actually get delivered? How fast was it? Because at the end of the day, we're all responsible for building endpoints, whether it's servers or apps or uh, the network nodes themselves. At the end of the day, it's all being built to deliver the application. It's trying to move data to that user. And that's what the end user is complaining about. They feel that application. They don't feel the endpoints. They're not going to call you up and say, hey, it's heavily utilized today. Oh, you're right. I have a gauge. It does say it's heavily utilized. We don't get that call, right? They say it's slow. The infrastructure is hidden from them. And that's good. We don't want them to know about the infrastructure, okay? What they care about is how quickly did it get from that end user to that server and vice versa, okay? So we need tools that monitor that, right? That was my big, long lead up to the point that, hey, guys, we need to monitor that. So what is TrueView? Dan talked about two solutions, OptiView and TrueView. I'm going to introduce TrueView first, and we'll see a demo of both of these as well, so you can get in and start figuring out how does this stuff all work. You can ask me all the technical questions. But the idea, the concept is we've built a single tool to try and replace what would have traditionally been done with five separate tools. Okay? You can see those five use cases here. Response time first and foremost, because when we want to troubleshoot data, again, our users call and complain about slow, that's time. We have to monitor time. So we start from that perspective and say, yes, we see that it is slower. And then we tell you where it's slower. Was it on the server side or was it on the network side? Because that's a lot of times where the majority of the troubleshooting effort goes to is just figuring out whose problem is this to solve? It's great that as a tool you can tell me that it is slow, but I need to know where it's slow because I need to know where to focus my teams on, where to focus my efforts and attention. So we start from that response time and then we also are storing all the packets so it's a stream to disk solution. So if you find something that you want to investigate, you can pull the packets back up for that time frame. It's also doing traffic analysis, NetFlow, right? So it's not just where you're capturing packets that you understand. You're also going to get that remote perspective of Show me what all the WAN links are doing. Show me where my end users are going so that I can understand when I have a network performance issue, what are people doing on the network? We're also doing SNMP, device discovery and device uh, monitoring. So we need to be able to monitor those endpoints and see what CPU, memory, interface utilization. That's still important, but we want to move away from going there first. We want to start here and see where, if it points us to looking at this or see if it points us to looking at this. And then we're also monitoring voice over IP data as well. So the goal with all of this is you put this into, in, in many cases, a single box. We can distribute if it's a large enough environment, but the goal is this can be a single box solution. All of these five different data sources are in one UI. And so by putting this into a simple solution that can go from rack to reporting in less than half an hour, auto discovers the applications, automatically configures them and starts monitoring them, and it's done in an intuitive web interface 
the goal with all this, guys, is have you, have you guys ever had to do this before? Hold on, let me check my other tool. Hold on, let me check my other tool. Hold on, let me check my other tool, right? We have different tools for different needs. We instead build workflows based on what you're trying to troubleshoot. If you've got a network issue, there's a network troubleshooting workflow. That leads you down all the data from this pinwheel that's related to network. App issue, okay, we go down the, the app transaction issue, or the app uh, workflow. So instead of trying to make you go to the network traffic data or go to the response time data, we build workflows logically. We're also gonna automatically baseline performance because normal is subjective, right? What's, what's the industry standard for network round trip time? A trick question, right? There is no normal network round trip. There's no, there's no industry standard for that. Now there is for things like VoIP, right? We have MOS scores where we can say, you know, above this is, or is good and below is bad. But for things like network response and application response, those are completely subjective and it's what the user is used to experiencing day in and day out. We have to have a tool that's gonna automatically tell you, guys, I've looked at this data for a month. Here's where it normally is. People are feeling this. This is way too high. And it's gonna alert you to that fact. Talked about the guided workflows already. I think this kind, of, this kind of says it, right? This is exactly what I've been talking about. It's the idea is you have monitoring and troubleshooting. We'll tell you where the problems are and then help you get down to root cause and ideally replace you with what would have been five tools with just one simple to use tool, okay? I'm gonna hand off to Dan, who's gonna talk a little bit about the XG side. Do you want to, before we get to that, yeah. do you want to talk a little bit about where this is deployed, a little bit about, you know, to the extent that you can without the slide on it, about the yeah, architecture? Yeah, I've, I've got a, you know, it probably, probably should have just put it here. Why don't I just skip right to that appendix slide real fast? Okay. And, you know, we've got a very technical audience. It does help to have a visual, like, what is this magic box? Where are you putting it? What is it doing, right? So TrueView, again, can be deployed in a single box solution or a distributed Let's just say we're doing single box. You're gonna put it in your data center and it's gonna receive three types of data. We're gonna receive span or tap data. That's how we get that packet data. That's getting our response times. So it's sitting there as a stopwatch. It's also streaming those packets to disk. And that's where we're getting our voice over IP data as well. We wanna span that from as close as possible to our production servers. So we're sitting off the access layer here. We're getting that data as soon as it leaves the servers, right? That way we're able to isolate how much time was spent below this line, how much time was spent above this line, network versus application. We're also gonna collect the flow data that's coming from all of these remote offices or any other critical uplinks within your network, any aggregation points where you need to know what's traversing this link. And that's also gonna get exported to the system. And then we'll also SNMP poll any of these servers that we're monitoring for response time that we discover, we're gonna pull them. Any of these things that are sending us NetFlow data, we're gonna pull them. We wanna be able to give you that CPU, memory, availability, uh, interface utilization so that we can tell, okay, we understand that it's heavily utilized and, and that might be related to your issue, okay? So on the, on the spam tap, yeah. what kind of capacity? Oh, great question. So we have uh, one gig options. So those are two by one, four by one. And we also have uh, dual 10 gig options as well. And if you go back to Dan's uh, slide earlier, talking about Dan and her corporate, one of our sister companies is VSS. So that's a network packet broker. So if you ever need to go larger, we can add more boxes of our own, or we can use aggregation technologies to make sure we can fit that into uh, an affordable pipe, if you will. Any other questions? Very good. If you wanna go distributed, there's also a distributed architecture as well. Hey, maybe you've got two data centers. What do I have to do? Well, you put a, a TrueView Central on top. He's gonna to manage all of your TrueView systems. And then the TrueView can just turn into a multi-collector. He can keep collecting all those different kinds of data. Again, we don't have to have separate tools for each of these. And then I can just put a multi-collector at the other side to collect that data as well. We also have options to do purely NetFlow collection, purely span collection. You know, it will help you tailor something to meet your needs. Do you have any additional visibility into um, virtual environments, right? So if you're doing service chaining through virtual appliances, things like that, you know, those can be points of congestion delay and that sort of thing. I mean, do you, are you able to look at uh, anything deeper than just seeing the packets as they head off to that 
you know, virtual server and then back out. Yeah, so we, we've been taking advantage of some of the span technologies that VMware has introduced, for example, in 5.1, I think it was, right? So there's vSpan. You can get that data out from the system as it's for any of that intra-host traffic, right? That stuff that would normally not ever have to hit the switch. Uh, we usually ask to, hey, just give us a little feed of that data. Um, spit that out of the box and, uh, and we'll do that. There's also virtual tap options out there from VSS again, um, one of our sister companies. So yes, we can get that data. You said you had options for uh, just NetFlow mm -hmm. and so on. Does, does a deployment like that impact the quality of the tool, the capabilities of the tool? So you're saying if you only did NetFlow, you absolutely. You're only going to be able to see where the traffic is going and what's on these links. So I can tell you, you know, this is 80% utilized, and I can tell. Oh, sorry, I'm not supposed to get in front. I can tell you that's 80% utilized, and that it's, you know, the mo the majority of its internet traffic and where it's going to. But I can't tell you what the response time was anymore because I don't have someone calculating the response time here. I need to do that that TCP acknowledgement timing to get that understanding of how fast things are. I have a question. Yes. So that device right now is a hardware unit, correct? Correct. When is it going to be a software agent? So we have software options as well for things like if you're doing purely NetFlow collection, that can be deployed as software only. But when we're talking about the span collection, we're actually using, using dedicated hardware capture cards that we ourselves have created at Fluke um, to do some of that analysis. So it's a unique part of the solution that you absolutely have to have an appliance to accept those uh, in terms of that. But the... Um, this guy, see how he's got the little VM logo next to him? He can be a virtual machine because he doesn't have any special hardware on him. And same thing on that NetFlow side. Nothing unique about that hardware appliance, so it can just be a, an off-the-shelf server if you'd like. So your, your hardware or your hardware can collect a full 10 gig? Yes. Okay. Then what, storage? Uh, storage, we've got a couple different options here. Um, when you're talking about, you know, so we've got 12... 24 to 48 terabytes on some of our larger boxes, working on a future release to increase that. Um, I guess that's not secret. Anyways. Um, not now. No, no, no. <laughs> Zach just said it. Um, we can go larger, though. Yeah, we can, we can go larger. But our standard appliances are going to go up to uh, 48 terabytes right now. And if you go virtual form factor, what's, what's the plan for that for when a customer has that option? Well, that virtual form factor is only going to apply for the flow data, though. Typically, when we're talking about um, how much storage you need. Typically people are asking for packets, like how many packets can I store? So that's why I specifically keyed into that. But if you're doing NetFlow, the more storage you give us, the longer we can store flows. One of the things I didn't mention was we pride ourselves on storing the most granular data in the industry. Obviously we store all the packets that we get for as long as we can, FIFO, right? We roll over it. Uh, it's the same thing with the, the raw flow data. So we'll store raw flows by default for a week, but if you give us infinite storage, We'll just keep storing flows, whereas a lot of the... database architecture is? I did not. Um, it depends on which part of the tool you're into. There's um, some of it is, let me think here. We've got Postgres for some of it. We've got uh, Microsoft SQL for some of it. Um, but it's all SQL of some flavor yeah, or another? Yeah, okay. it's all SQL of some flavor or another. And is the data actually rolled up or rolled over? So we keep raw flow data and that starts rolling over, right? And raw packets, and those will roll over and you lose the oldest stuff. But we, of course, will roll up so that you can store data for a year at higher granularities, right? And that varies from anywhere from one minute to 15 minute to hourly to daily, right? There's different roll up intervals inside of that. Obviously, the product has a focus on granular data collection, but if you have, let's say, oversubscribed uh, spans where mm -hmm. you're only getting a sampling of the data rather than all of it, mm -hmm. uh, is the product effective enough to actually be able to extract reasonable information when you yeah. haven't have everything? Yeah, I think you'll find that the uh, even if you're losing data on the span port, right, you've got some oversubscribed um, span links. Obviously, we'll miss those transactions, and there may be things we can't fully calculate. But you'll find that the the averages, when you start looking at you know the one minute averages and things like that, things are still going to compute. You're going to notice when there's a performance issue. Um, obviously, every situation varies a little bit, and if, I'm sure you could find me a situation where you managed to drop the right packets and didn't see something. Uh, but in general, statistically, it should come out to be fine. And you want to get useful information out of the shell. Exactly. <coughs> Yep. Especially with the baselining, right? It's going to start to understand. Here's what's normal, and mm, this looks a little wacky. And are you, are you when you're uh, talking about response time calculation or measurement, are you looking um, only at 
layer four and down, TCP sequence numbers, or acts, that sort of thing? Or are you looking at the application layers? And if so, how do you deal with SSL? We are looking at the application layer. We're gonna see an example of that during the live demonstration in a couple of minutes, and we'll show the layer seven decodes that we have available and how we can get really unparalleled granularity on the transaction layer at layer seven. Uh, we also do layer four in case you've got some custom app that doesn't fit some decode that we have. And for SSL decryption, we have a couple of options. You can, of course, put a, uh, a box in front of it. VSS has a V inspector that can just decrypt everything coming in off the span for us so we don't even have to look at it. Um, you can leave everything encrypted going into the box. And then what we have is we store all the packets. You see a transaction that's slow, you open those up. We have our own viewer of packets as well called ClearSight Analyzer, and that lets you decrypt as you open up the packets. That way they're still encrypted at rest, and when you open it up, okay, then you enter the key. So you can import the server keys to... Into okay. that analyzer, okay. absolutely. Didn't know you guys had ClearSight, that's good. We do have ClearSight, yeah. Cool. Excellent, excellent analyzer. Uh, it has a great reputation, really easy to use. Um, and that's part of our solution as well. You get a free copy of ClearSight Viewer uh, along with TrueView so that you can start to analyze those packets. Um, with that, any more questions? Is, is this all developed in-house by Fluke, or is this uh, part of this technology something you bought? Most of it's developed in-house. There was a, an acquisition of Cranog uh, back in like 08 that we got the NetFlow technology from. Um, that used to be called NetFlow Tracker, so that's no longer a separate product. It's been completely integrated. I think Dan really keyed in on it earlier when he saw that, showed that Jim Frey quote. This isn't a bunch of tools that were stitched together with right clicks and you know separate user logins all over the place. It's literally, you're going to see in a little bit, one UI that you're going to, and all the products are, are fully integrated now. But the, the, the APM data or the, the response time data, the SNMP, the VoIP, that's all written in-house. Okay. Yeah. Dan, I'll hand to you. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm gonna, I wanted to make sure that Dan has a chance to introduce the XG because that's the other part of the solution, and then we'll hand off to demo time. Okay. So uh, the OptiView is what we call we call it the all-in-one tablet for network analysis for network engineers. Fast way to prove it's not the network. To Zach's point, here we are in 2014, and it's still the network is slow, but I have to prove that it's not. Um, we've developed the OptiView, and some of our customers call it the Swiss Army knife for the network engineer. It is a multifunction tool that is very different from, say, other tools on the marketplace, like different from a network management system, although it has network management features. It is a packet capture tool, but it's got dedicated hardware, so it's going to do it at line rate. Uh, it is a wireless analysis tool, but the hardware is embedded within the product, so it's different from uh, what you would have cobbled together from other tools on the market. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, part of that integration is end user response time analysis from TrueView on the OptiView. And we'll talk about a specific feature on OptiView that's also available in the TrueView user interface. Network analysis, our term for network analysis is what you'd largely be familiar with looking at SNMP-based solutions. We use SNMP other various methods of doing network discovery to discover all of the devices on a network, uh, where are they connected, who's connected to who, what is the path, how is the path performing, are there any errors or conditions on the path that could be impacting performance. Wireless analysis, um, we mentioned ClearSight, so ClearSight falls into our traffic and packet analysis bucket. Uh, the same year that we acquired ClearSight Networks and ClearSight Analyzer and the Network Time Machine, we also acquired Air Magnet. So OptiView as a platform is a Windows 7 PC, and we run the Air Magnet mobile products, Survey Pro, Wi-Fi Analyzer, and Spectrum XT on the product itself, all integrated. I, I just mentioned traffic and packet analysis. Uh, this is both real-time packet inspection so that we can see in real time what traffic is coming into the analyzer uh, off of a span port or off of a tap port. Uh, and packet analysis is that clear side analyzer. Network performance testing is the ability to generate, generate test traffic and send that traffic across the network to another device. Uh, we have other endpoints that can generate full line rate 10 gigabit per second traffic bidirectionally and lower performance tools that will simply do reflection of traffic, and even a PC-based uh, software reflector that can be installed on a PC at a remote location. So those are the key multi-areas of function. 
The technologies I've kind of mentioned, it's one gig to 10 gig, so this can be used anywhere from the access layer to the data center. The key thing here is, as Zach mentioned, a key differentiator about TrueView is this custom hardware that was developed by Fluke Networks. Same applies in the OptiView. In fact, the core of this hardware is shared between the two platforms. And that gives us full line rate ability to capture at 10 gig, to transmit at 10 gig, and not lose any packets when we're doing that. Uh, it is a full 802.11 analyzer, uh, embedded wireless radios, two Wi-Fi radios for uh, channel analysis and wireless traffic analysis, and a spectrum radio for looking at sources of wireless interference. Again, all integrated into the unit, uh, no external adapters required. Uh, so really it's for the network engineer to analyze anything, and the mode of use is either going to be fixed or portable. Uh, in the old days, if you're familiar with some of our tools, they usually were kept locked in a drawer because you didn't want them walking away. And when a problem happened, you would grab it and you would go to the problem area. And of course, we still support that use model. But with the addition of the ability to do some 24 by 7 monitoring, uh, querying of the network, and active tests that run in the background, most of our customers have moved to the use model of leaving this connected somewhere in the data center, and remotely connecting to it through a remote software that runs on your PC. Uh, we support up to 32 separate sessions of that simultaneously, so everyone on a network ops team can have access to that tool remotely. Including the Mac users? Because there's a couple. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, it is a uh, Windows program, so however you would run that, of course. So that saves having the daycare nursery for the firstborn that you have to collect to make sure you get the analyzer back when somebody borrows it. <laughs> you got that right. You got that right. So what we're talking about integration specifically between the two products is the integration of what we call path analysis from OptiView, and we'll see that in the demo, which is our ability to discover what is the connection path from endpoint to endpoint in the network and what is occurring on that path. We're feeding that information into TrueView, and from TrueView, we're taking the end user response time information and feeding that into OptiView. So here's the use model. If I'm a network engineer sitting in my network operations area, and I have got TrueView, and I've got OptiView deployed, and a user is complaining of a, you know, the network is slow. I've got the ability to look at a time correlated data of that end user response time and what that problem is and where it's happening. And then I have the diagnostics coming to TrueView from OptiView so that we can actually see into the path and see into the devices even out at the remote sites. Likewise with OptiView, with the end user response time information from TrueView, if I have gone mobile, if I'm out at that remote site, I'm out troubleshooting in the network, or if I'm just remoting into the OptiView instead of my TrueView, I can see the end user response time and get that instant identification of is this a, truly a network issue that I have to pay attention to or is it an application problem and I would go into TrueView to pull the information to give to the appropriate party. So, did you take from there? I'll take the last one and, we'll, and, then, uh, we'll, and then we'll go then into we'll a live demo, take a demo. quick break, yeah. So the, the goal by having all of these things is to help you get out of this routine that we see so frequently with our customers, and that's the IT blame game. What we have here is a single data source that can be used really by any team. There's data that we'll see that's usable by server teams, by app teams, by network teams, and when we tell you there's a performance problem, right at that time of collection, I mentioned this before, we're identifying how much time was spent on each side of this line where we're deployed, saying how much time is spent out on the network, getting there and back, how much time is spent for the server to start responding to those requests and, give, and delivering that data. And of course, as Dan mentioned, we've got that, that really granular visibility with the XG as well. It can start doing those tests out at a remote site. We can take it and start investigating devices, doing tests on the network. So it's really complete visibility to help avoid the scenario that we see so frequently. So with that said, we will move on into a live demonstration. <laughs> 